life and my life is like a lamp to a world that is searching for the path. We have become the example of Christ and we are now the light of the world. Can the world see the radiance of Christ in you? Evangelism does not happen by accident. Discipleship does not happen by accident. If we're going to fulfill our God-given mission as a church, we need to be intentional and reach out and share and introduce people to Jesus Christ. is an amazing continent with 50% of its population under the age of 18. If we impact the children, we would have impacted the future of the church and the future of our world. Each one of us has something to bring to the table. Are you willing to release your resources, surrendering your material goods or your gifts and talents or your time or your heart? What are you going to do? If we're going to plant the 300 churches, if we're going to reach out to a million people through evangelism, if we're going to disciple 100,000 in this nation, and if we are going to have an impact with the poor, with the needy, with children, with all the others who are part of our communities around us, it's not going to happen unless you have committed yourself to the purposes of God and you have been faithful to live by those purposes. have celebrated the biker community. Uh, I think it's also a good time to celebrate the passenger community. If you can pa celebrate the passenger community, come on, come on, give it up. Okay, awesome, awesome. Yeah, we are all passengers, and uh, I was going to say something about border borders, but then the border, border border chairman came, so I'm going to refrain my remarks uh, to a private conversation uh, about that. By the way, anybody ever been a passenger on a border border in the city of Nairobi, like on the streets. Father, I want to remember these ones. <laughs> and thank you for their boldness and pray that you will give them courage in Jesus' name. Now, our time is gone, uh, or mostly gone. I'm going to ask for your indulgence for a few minutes so that we get to share God's word. I'm reminded of a story of a preacher who was preaching, and he kept on preaching, and uh, I think they are called everlasting preachers. And uh, he kept on preaching, and uh, at some point, a young boy who was at the front started bothering his father and started jumping up and down, uh, trying to get uh, the attention of the parent. But then a frog came into the church, and he started hopping just right uh, through the aisle of the, of the church, or the center aisle of the church. And the pastor paused, pensive, paused, looked at the frog, and he asked the congregation, what do you think God is telling us through that frog? And, you know, everyone is trying to, you know, get something deep because you know how you behave when the pastor asks a question, right? You have to answer something deep, something spiritual. And so the little boy kept raising his hands and nobody was, you know, paying attention to him. Eventually, the pastor asked him, young man, what do you think God is saying through the frog? And the young man told the pastor, just like God told Pharaoh, so is he telling you. Let, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be... We'll be doing that, we'll be doing that in a moment. My task here is to get us to talk about the church in Jerusalem and particularly to talk about how God let them loose into what they were doing, into what they were supposed to do. And a key thing that played in their lives that enabled them to do this was prayer. So I'm going to be focusing on, on prayer a bit. The, the Bible says in Luke chapter 10, verse 2, Jesus lifting up his eyes told the people, hey, look out and see that the harvest 
is ripe. Pray earnestly, therefore, that the Lord of the harvest will send laborers into the harvest field, of course, to go and harvest. It reminds me of a story of a young man who one day uh, was pledged to be married to this young lady. And because of some confusion and some grudge that happened, he walked off the engagement and went to another place. And after a while, he went back to go and check on the girl and see whether the girl was available as before, only to find that the father of the girl had given over this girl to his best man. Please note, if you're getting married and you are here, be very careful which, what kind of best man you have. Uh, if he's the one who looks like the, the kind that can take her away, just, just be cautious. Anyway, anyway, he's given over, or the girl is given over to this young man, and this, uh, this man goes and tells the father, I want my wife. And he's told, no, she was given away. And in heated anger, he went and caught 300 foxes. It's in the Bible. 300 foxes. Now, he brought the foxes together. I don't know how he put them together. I don't know whether he brought them and told them, you stay here, you know. But he brought the 300 foxes together, paired them up by their tails, and then he took firebrands and put on them and released them into the harvest of the Philistine territory. The harvest was burnt by these 150 pairs of foxes going into it and burning it up and taking in everything. My prayer is that by the end of this service, whether the Lord chooses to pair us up or to send us one by one, that he's going to send us in his harvest field, church on the loose, sent forth to go and do God's work in the harvest field that God has given us in Jesus' name. I pray that we will get to understand that through the book of Acts, that God birthed the church, God grew the church, and God used the church to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ up to the ends of the earth. We are recipients of the same because of people who are obedient to pray and to do their piece of work to ensure that the gospel continues being spread. And I pray that it will not stop with us, will not be the last recipients, but God is going to use us to extend this even further. And in case you are here and you're not a believer, just relax. I'm going to be giving you an opportunity at the end of this service to make a decision to have Jesus as your personal savior so that even as you become a recipient, you become also a carrier of what God has for us today. So in this regard, can I ask that we turn to Acts chapter 1? I'm going to read a few, or I'm going to make reference to a few passages in Acts chapter 1 just to demonstrate to us uh, some of the things that were happening in, in the church in Jerusalem. When Jesus was ascended, uh, the, the Acts chapter 1 will tell us about the ascension of Jesus. When Jesus was ascended, he told his disciples, you go and back to Jerusalem and wait until when you'll receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And then you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, uh, and then to the other ends of the world. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1 verse 14, when they went back to, their, to the house where they were meeting, and they went to that upper room, they all joined together in prayer. They did not sit around trying to figure out what do we do now that Jesus is gone. They actually joined together constantly is the word that is used there along with the women, with Mary the mother of Jesus, the brothers and everyone else who was present. They started out in meeting in prayer. Chapter 2 of Acts tells us, in chapter 2 verse 42, it tells us and the believers were devoted to these four things. Number one, the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and also to what? To prayer. It became a devotion. It became part of them. Some of us are devoted to food. We even have a name. It's Mafundi. Foodies. Okay? <laughs> Foodies is the English word. Mafundi in the Oyaki Soili. You know, we are devoted, we know every spot that you can get food. I, I, I would guess that bikers know every spot that you can get everything. I, I went around the tents and I was seeing some of the significant things that happen. I did not even know there is a legisl the legislation thing that happens with that. They, they are devoted to that, so they kind of focus on that. These guys were focused not only to the apostles' teaching and everything else that was happening, but also to prayer. Why I love that is because prayer is work. Did you know that? 
Hello, did you know that? Prayer is work. It takes a devotion, it takes energy, it takes time to get to, 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 to do this. And seeing them given to this is quite significant. That text that I'd love for us to read is in Acts chapter 4. And let me just give us a brief background about it. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John were going to pray. And when they were going to the temple to pray, they met a crippled man who was being brought uh, to the gate called Beautiful. And he was being brought there so that he, he, he could beg for alms. And when he saw Peter and John, he saw an opportunity to get more money. And so he told them, give me something. And Peter and John did not have money, like sincerely. And they looked at him and they told him, silver and gold we do not have. But what we have we will give unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the crippled man rose up and walked. And people were amazed at what had happened. And they gathered and the gospel was preached. And a lot of people came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their savior that day. The leading people, the leading religious leaders felt this was not right. And so they called Peter and John. They beat them up. They threatened them. And they told them, you go and never preach this gospel again. And Peter and John went back. But they did something interesting. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4, verse 23. Allow me to read there. On their release... Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father, David, saying this. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and to perform miracles and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. I mean, you come from a beating, you come from a, a place where you are threatened, you come from a place where you are warned never to preach the gospel again. And instead of calling for a press conference to discuss the threats against your life, you go into prayer. How about that? And you go into prayer, and you are praying, asking the sovereign Lord to make you even more bolder to do his mission and his work. What a challenge to us. This will happen again in Acts chapter 12. When Herod decided to persecute the church, and he started by killing their leaders. He killed James, the leader of the church, and then he arrested, the Bible says, the people are pleased. And so he decided to arrest Peter. And he arrested Peter. And he put him under chains. And he put him actually between two soldiers who guarded him and other guards at the door. And then four duties of soldiers just to make sure that they are not tired. But the Bible says in Acts 12, uh, verse 5, that the church earnestly gathered to pray. And they prayed, and the Lord did a miracle. That same night, an angel of the Lord came and broke the chains under which Peter had been chained and walked him outside. And when he walked him outside, he got him into this place where Peter kind of woke up and figured, um, this is not a vision, this is reality. You know, I, I am being set free here. And he walked right back to one of the homes where the believers were gathered to pray for Peter to be released. And a lady came to the door. When Peter knocked, a lady came to the door, and her question was, uh, when, you know, you see Peter and you go like, you go back and you go like, Peter is at the door. I, I mean, the practical thing is to open for Peter to come in, just in case the kanjo is following, right? And the guards, <laughs> that's what you do practically. She went back to tell them, hey, Peter is at the door, and they could not believe it. And they went back, and they received him, and they rejoiced together over what was happening. Key point, the church was there, gathered to pray for Peter. It's remarkable that this church prayed. They prayed when there was trouble. 
They prayed when there was joy. They prayed whenever they had a chance. They kept their regular schedule of prayer. Their leaders were persecuted, and the church prayed. Their leaders were released, and the church prayed. They included everyone in their prayer gatherings. Women, men, leaders, the apostles, Jesus' brothers, who must have been close to Jesus, and even house servants who were there. And I believe if as Nairobi Chapel, if as believers, God is going to set us loose. God is going to set us on fire. If you can put that image up back again of a church on the loose, you see somebody just taking off. I almost thought it was for Biker's Day because there is some flame at the back. Somebody taking off. Uh, if, if there was a way that God will get us to go out on fire and become loose and do what God desires for us to do, then we have to become a church of prayer. We have to emulate the church of Jerusalem and become a church of prayer. Now, I know that there are believers who are in here and people who love listening to God's word and would love to go home with a point or two, at least to say the preacher said something. So, here's point number one. <laughs> the church in Jerusalem had collective prayer. Collective prayer prayer. That is quite significant that the, the, the Bible points out that to us, that they were marked by collective prayer. Now, I do believe that they had time for personal prayer. After all, Jesus had set an example for them on a daily basis. For three years, he had taught the disciples, he had taught those who followed him, that this is important. He'd go to the mountain by himself or, or, or on the side a bit to go and pray. They knew it. So, personal prayer is important. But there is something powerful about collective prayer. There's something powerful about collective prayer in the, in, the, in the church in Jerusalem. There is something powerful about collective prayer when we start doing it here, right at Nairobi Chapel. You see, what collective prayer does is that it removes from us that personal, selfish focus. When I am praying for myself, I, I, I lead a church, but when I'm praying for myself, I pray for the needs around me. I, I, I pray for a car. I pray, I pray for a, an increment in salary, Pastor Nick, just, just so that you know. Uh, you know <laughs> we pray for promotions. We pray for, 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 for God to open doors. We, we, we pray that we will be safe. We sprinkle the blood of Jesus and apply it everywhere as concerns our lives. But did you know that when you meet to pray, maybe as an e-group or as a small group, I don't know whether the Nyumbakumis get to pray. I am interested in the Dika Road one, okay? Uh, whoever is sharing that, please see me. I'd love to hang out with you guys. Uh, you know, when you meet as a group and you start praying, there is something about people starting to share their needs that makes your needs actually fade in the eyes of everything. You come to pray together and you're asked, what are your prayer requests? Now, some of them are unspoken, but let's talk about the spoken ones, okay? And you start saying, I am trusting God for a promotion. And people go like sour. The next person says, I'm trusting God for a job. The last two years, I've not had a job. All of a sudden, your promotion, as much as you want it, are, are we together? <laughs> some of you come, pray for my husband. I don't know what is going on with him. Another one says, pray for me for a Yes, you, you get, you know, there is something about your, your selfish focus or personal focus that shifts when we start praying collectively. And what would happen with the Jerusalem church is as they continued praying collectively and communally, God kept pointing out that my mission for this church and for this gospel is bigger than your personal needs. I am going to provide for your personal needs, but you better focus on why God is is present in your midst. And my prayer is that Nairobi Chapel soaks itself in collective prayer so that we are able to do this. Now, I do realize that two of the meetings that people barely attend are evangelism meetings and what? What is that? Shindwe. Uh, <laughs> evangelism meetings and, and what? Prayer meetings. People barely go for them. 
And we are never going to exercise the spiritual power God has given us and still we start exercising the place of collective prayer. Never going to have that. In fact, one of the tragedies we have as a church, and I say this knowing that I'm, I'm, I'm part of the problem, maybe by declaring it from the front, is having an intercessory department. And people love the intercessory department because they know those people are praying. They have the gift of prayer. Me, I have the gift of singing. The other one has the gift of ushering. And I have the gift of shouting to the Lord. You know, and so on and so forth. And we continue like that. And sometimes what happens is we think because others are praying, we are not going to pray ourselves. I hope and I do believe that God is calling each one of us to that place where when we are called to gather, whether it's earlier before the service starts, or maybe it's during the service, or maybe it's that special service that we have once a month uh, on, on the last Friday of the month, where we get to come and praise the Lord as we pray together. We gather and pray collectively, and God is going to do something different in our midst. There are two things that collective prayer does. Number one, it broadens our focus. It makes us to see things in a broader perspective. Helps us to do that. But number two, it helps us to be bolder. Not just broader, but it helps us to be broader, uh, bolder, sorry, in our prayers. And so I ask and I encourage us, if we're going to be the church on the loose, if we're going to emulate the church in Jerusalem, then we better meet together and get to pray. But number two, apart from collective prayer, was consistent prayer. Remarkable, consistent prayer. Chapter 1, verse 14 of Acts says, the believers, those apostles, they met constantly in prayer. Chapter 2, verse 42 says, they were devoted to prayer. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, when Peter and John were going for the hour of prayer, in other words, there was a set hour where they would go and pray. The other day, uh, we were coming from Busia and we were delayed at the Busia border and coming back uh, to, to the country. And there was this one passenger who was sitting next to us of the Muslim faith. And uh, we were seated with this pastor friend of mine. And we, we, we had noted that on the way, he would just pause at a certain hour and get to pray. And we are here complaining at the border. There was some, some, some ruckus that had happened at the border. And as good Kenyans, we were there complaining and, you know, fighting for our rights. <laughs> Only to realize this guy has gone for his hour of prayer. Two pastors busy fighting for their rights. <laughs> this fella has gone for his hour of prayer. We came and stopped in Kisumu and we bought lunch. The fellow bought a few things, wrapped them up, went to a room, washed his feet, and went to pray. 6 p.m. found us somewhere on the road, still coming this way. He took his time, prayed, then he opened his food and ate. How many of you have a regular eating time? <laughs> oh, hands down, I can see you. <laughs> How about you have a regular time of prayer? Such that it's so consistent and so constant that it is part of your life as it is part of your breathing. Because there is no revival that is going to happen. There is no urgency that is going to be built in us unless we are in that place where we are constantly praying. January has a tendency, I'll tell you about Ruiro. January has a tendency in Ruiro to bring people to church and they're coming you know, for the touch of God. At the beginning of the year, pastor, pray for me, touch me with oil, and so on and so forth. How about you consistently pray if these matters are that urgent? Some of us pray for our parents or for our siblings or for our children to get to know Jesus Christ as their personal savior, but we make mention of it. It's not a constant or a consistent thing. It's not going to change things. We need to be serious about it. If we're going to be the church on the loose, then we better be consistent about what we pray on and we pray about there's a, there's a church in our neighborhood. Man, they pray all the time. Let them pray. I'm okay with that. It's just that from time to time they use the PA to pray. And I'm thinking, you are five of you. Why do you, God is already hearing you. It's a time I wanted to nap. And this guy is from Uganda. He just picks the mic and starts speaking in a language that I do not understand. And I can no longer nap. And so, 
I went back, but there are two of them consistently praying. I, that day I told my wife, I need to pray for jobs for these two. <laughs> so that they are not available in church to pray. And then it hit me. At the very least, they are praying. And so I invited their pastor to our church. I went and sat down with him and told him, what is this that you guys have that you are always praying? How have you set your congregation to always pray? How about you come and teach us how as Trinity Chapel Ruiru, we can be praying all the time? How about that? Imagine if this space, whenever we walked into it, there were people who were consistently praying for the church, praying for the gospel, praying for the mission of God, praying that the church is set on the loose consistently. But number three, not only were they collectively praying and consistently praying, there were concrete results from their prayers. Concrete results from their prayers. The text that we read in Acts chapter 4, when Peter led in the prayer, he prayed, Lord, give us boldness to spread the gospel, but also perform miracles in our midst. And guess what? God did that. And I think there are three results that just jump out for me of what happened while the church continued praying. Number one, they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit consistently. In Acts chapter 2, flames of fire came upon them and people started asking, what is this that is going on? And, you know, a coward fisherman, Peter, all of a sudden is empowered to do something different from what he would do. Do you remember that time that Jesus was coming from the mountain and he was presented a child who was demon-possessed? And he was told, your disciples have been praying for this child, but they have not succeeded in deliverance for him. And Jesus told them, these ones do not go apart from what? Prayer and fasting. There is a certain empowering that comes from that waiting on the Lord, that, 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 that waiting on the Lord consistently. They, there's a certain empowering that comes from that. And they were empowered to do that. But number two, they were emboldened, became bold in their witness and in their spread of the gospel. In fact, the religious leaders of the day pointed out that these men that we have arrested are unschooled. They are fishermen. That has been their past. There is something that they have within them that we cannot understand. It's something that is happening within their lives that, that maybe is different and it was a boldness that was given to them by the Holy Spirit. I've, I've, I've never forgotten uh, uh, one day um, when I was younger. Please try and imagine me younger. Slimmer, younger. We had been taught on how to do witnessing. 1994, September. Never forgotten this story. Been taught about how to do witnessing, go out two by two, go and witness, bring the souls. And so we went. After a time of prayer uh, and a time of training, we went, went house to house witnessing. And one of, one of the brothers in the church came and, uh, and took the person that I had been given and gave, gave, gave them to their partner and told me, come with me. And so we went to this brother and he told me, today, this witnessing that we are doing is very slow. This going house to house is very slow. What we need to do is we need to find a blind person or a crippled person and pray for them. Once they get healed, the whole place is going to know we are, we are serious. It's going to be quicker. And you can imagine how ridiculous that sounds. And so we went into the village asking, Kuna Kipofu, you, you, you get how ridiculous it is, eh? Kuna Kipofu, Amakiwen, and God is faithful. We found a blind person. Okay, that's the faithfulness of God. So we went into this house. It was a small mud house. We entered. We, of course, interviewed him, asking him, how, how long have you been blind? We were looking for somebody who had been blind for long, not, not recent. You know, something that people know, so that the people will see the miraculous working power of God. And so we asked him, we interviewed him, and then we started praying for him. Where? See, we prayed. <laughs> we prayed. We prayed. We went around that house praying. We laid hands on him. We spoke in tongues. We, we did everything. After a while, we asked him, can you see anything? 
I, I tend to think the guy was familiar with, with the Bible because he, he, he told us, I, can, I, I cannot clearly, I see in, you know, you remember those KBC things eh, that used to come? I, I am singing, it's, the Greek word for it is marundurundu. I, I, I cannot see very clearly, but I can see something. Now, I think he thought by telling us that we will go. We were fired up. <laughs> we just went like, ah, you know, like, we were fired up. And so we continued praying. And we prayed and we prayed. And you know, by the time we left, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, he had received his spiritual sight. <laughs> <laughs> he, <laughs> the guy reached a point, I <laughs> That's... Let's pray for me to get saved. Maybe God will do step by step. I'll see spiritual sight and physical sight and so on. But we were bold enough to go and do that. Just ask yourself, what's the last time that you did something bold for God? Because you cannot dare to go doing bold things for God without backup. Are we together? There are some guys in the Bible, sons of a priest. <laughs> Try and imagine my sons. Sons of a priest called the sons of Sceva. One day they decided to go into the house of a guy who was possessed by demons. And they went and told him, in the name of Jesus Christ, whom Paul preaches. Atuna, back up. Are we together? Atuna, back up. The, the Bible says they were beaten. In fact, they fled that, that place without clothes. But something interesting, just to draw from that. Do you know, these guys, when they were going out, and when they were bold enough to go and do this, do you know many times it was not themselves presenting to the people and saying, let us preach the gospel to you. They were not printing flyers. They were not putting up posters. They were not sending stuff on social media. It was the people who were asking them, tell us about what you know that makes you different. So let me ask you, what is it that is in you, that in your compound, people go like, if you have any problem, if you are struggling at your job, go to so-and-so, at least they'll pray for you. At your workplace, ukonashida, Go to that person. They will pray for you. At least we know they're a believer. At least we know that, that they pray. Have you ever been suspected of being a prayer? Prayer ni mutwa naomba. Ita is somebody who? Prayer is somebody who? Yeah. Have you ever been suspected of being a prayer? Pray until you become a prayer. They were emboldened in that. But number three... They expected results. They expected results. If we are going to trust God for salvation, if we are going to trust God for people in our family, for people who are in our neighborhood, for people who are in this city, we keep talking about the fact that less than 10% of this city gets to go to church on a Sunday. If we are going to trust God to increase those numbers and to multiply the spread of the gospel, then we better pray. And then expect God to bring us the results. These guys never prayed without expecting something to happen. Bishop uh, Marvin Winans, during the 100 year celebration of Azusa Conference, he said that when Peter and John went out and they met the cripple, they told the cripple, silver and gold we do not have, but that which we have we give unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he said, you know, possibly the problem with the church today is that silver and gold we do have. And maybe we have not learned how to depend on the name of Jesus. As the saving power, as the empowering power, as a trust that we have, as a place that we can go and call on his name and trust him to do something in our lives. My prayer is that Nairobi Chapel is going to be different. It's going to be loosened like those foxes into the harvest field of God. First, because they choose to spend time in collective prayer, asking God, would you move in our midst like you moved in the church in Acts? 
that they're going to be so constant and so consistent in prayer that even people know that they are a prayer in themselves. But that we are going to pray while expecting results from God. We are going to pray while expecting results from God. Because we know that God, our God is able to, to do it. Shall we pray? Everlasting Father, we want to thank you for this time that you have given us to hear from your word and to hear that you do desire for us to be let loose, to be let go, so that we can go and do God's work out there. We are here to be serviced so that we can serve the people that God has called us to serve. And today I want to pray that you will start turning us around even as a congregation. While we learn from the Jerusalem church that they prayed and God visited them with greater numbers of increase in the church. More people coming to the Lord. Miracles happening in their midst. The move of God, the empowering of God, the emboldening of God. The expectation from God happening right in their midst. And I pray that this will be the story of Nairobi Chapel. That will not gather here because of banners or because of coolness. But we're going to gather here because there is the power of God working in our midst in the name of Jesus. I want to pray for two categories of people right here. Maybe you're here and just listening to that, you, you look at your neighborhood, you look at your workplace, you look at the people you know, maybe even your, your siblings, your parents, maybe it's even your spouse. And, and, and you're saying, I'm not praying enough. I, I just need to ask God, would you empower me? Would you create a hunger in me? Would you create an urgency in me? Would you create a devotion in me to pray? and you want me to pray for you, just raise your hand where you are. I'd love to pray for you. Heavenly Father, these who raise their hands come because they trust you and they depend on you. I ask you by your strength, by your power, by you who creates a hunger and a thirst in us to seek you and to long for you, that you would do it for them in the name of Jesus. That you'll fill them with that urgency, with, with that need, with that longing to, to pray and even to gather, and even to seek the face of the Lord, and to trust in God that even as we pray to Him, and even as we seek Him, our God will come down and do only what God can do, even in our midst. I pray that you will charge them up, and that they will become like a fire that goes even to others, and infects others, so that we can be able to be a praying church that trusts God to bring in the harvest through the prayers that we offer. And so, God, I pray that that will not die down in us. It will be consistent in us. It will be a devotion in us. It will be a longing in us, not only to pray for ourselves, but to pray for the mission of God to be fulfilled, even on this earth and in His work. Let me pray for a second category. You are here. And while I speak God's word, I want to believe that maybe you're here and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Maybe for lack of opportunity to give your life to Jesus. Or maybe you have postponed that time. Or maybe you're here and you have been a believer in the past. But then because of circumstances of the world or of sin, you fell away from that. And today you want to commit your life to Jesus. You want to ask him, would you be my personal savior? The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, the people turned around in the crowd and they asked Peter, what shall we do with this message that we have heard? And he told them, believe in Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And I want to encourage you today that you can believe in Jesus Christ and you can be saved. It's the best decision you could ever make in this world. It's the best decision that you could ever make that would help you to be able to move with surety of your destiny, with eternity, with a companion, with a help. His name is Jesus. And you want to ask him into your life today. Can I ask that you raise your hand where you are? And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. That's where you are. And I ask that you raise your hand. Can I ask uh, some of our leaders who are seated in sections just to stand up and look around because I cannot see way to the back. If you're here and you're asking Jesus into your life and you want me to pray for you, just raise your hand where you are. I'd love to lead you to the Lord. 
uh, this afternoon. Just raise that hand. Keep it raised, my brother. Thank you so much. Is there somebody else who's asking, Lord Jesus, I want to give you my life and you are here and you want me to pray for you. Just raise your hand where you are. I'd love to do this. I'd love to lead you to the Lord. If there's a section leader who gets to see that there is a hand right towards my left, is there somebody else who's asking that? I, I can't see all across the room. So I'm asking the leaders just to help me look around. Is there somebody else who's asking, I need this prayer today. I need this prayer today. I need to receive Jesus Christ. There is another hand to my, to my left. If I can have somebody just pray with a lady to my left. Just keep that hand raised until somebody gets to you. Until somebody gets to you. And I have a, is somebody just to my left, just to the, to, the, to the left of me. Is there somebody else saying, I need that prayer today. I need that prayer today. Best decision you could ever make. Even to come back to the Lord and tell the Lord, I, I want to receive you as my Savior. I want to receive you as my Savior. That's today. We'd love to pray with you. And if you're there and maybe I've not seen you, just say this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you, a sinner in need of your forgiveness. I thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and for his salvation that he offers me. Today, I receive you as my Savior and as my Lord. Come into my life. Make me a new creature. Make me your child. Write my name in the book of life. In Jesus' name.